After a frustrating loss to the Carolina Hurricanes, Minnesota Wild trying to get back into the win column against the Panthers. We take a look at the matchup, plus we'll talk about Matt Dumba being a healthy scratch for the second game in a row on today's pregame edition of Locked on Wild. You're locked on wild. Your daily podcast on the Minnesota Wild. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to a pregame edition of Locked On Wild, your daily Minnesota Wild podcast. Part of the Locked On Sports Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you, as always, for making Lockdown Wild your first listen each and every day. Just a reminder, you can find everything that Lockdown Wild has to offer on all of your favorite podcast platforms absolutely free of charge. On today's pregame preview, we talk with Kevin Gorg about the Carolina Hurricanes loss and look ahead to the matchup against the Florida Panthers. Plus, we'll talk about some of the lineup changes that we will see against Florida. My name is Seth Topol, your daily Minnesota Wild insider. We bring in Kevin Gorg live from Florida on the road, traveling with the Minnesota Wild. And Kevin, a tough one for the Wild against the Hurricanes. But I think things started off uh, in a way that you thought, hey, maybe the Wild can uh, can sneak a win out. They weather that first punch by the Hurricanes, get the early goal. But as the penalties started to mount, it just seemed like the Hurricanes got more and more momentum and it became too much to uh, to try to overcome. Yeah, we had that conversation with Dean Evison morning of the game. And, you know, Carolina was coming off a really tough loss at home to Vancouver where they blew a late lead. They had all that extra time to get ready. The Wild had been traveling and running around, it seems like, all month. And so Dean talked about those first 10 minutes and, you know, not putting yourself in a position where you have to chase the game and, you know, trying to steady the ship. And even though they took a penalty less than a minute into the game, Mark andre Fleury was brilliant. He made three or four giant saves in the first 10 minutes. And so all of a sudden you look up and you're like, well, you know, the Wild have weathered the storm. They're, they've, they've got themselves in a good position. They get the Kaprizov goal. They have a lead. But in the end, seven penalties is way, way too many, especially against a skilled team like the Hurricanes. And, you know, Freddie Anderson played awfully well on the other end, too. I think, you know, you look at the score and you say, oh, 5-2 and the power plays and the goal review, the goalie interference situation. Well, this game got away from the Wild. Yes and no. I mean, it did for sure early in the third. But, you know, I thought Anderson made some critical saves at key moments where that might have been a little different game, might have been a tighter game late in that hockey game. Yeah, and you talk about that five-minute power play late. It's not like the Wilds didn't have a lot of chances. They had some really good looks right in front, and Anderson just kept them out, and that ended up being the uh, the point in the game where you just you didn't feel like they were going to be able to uh, to bring the magic back. No, you're exactly right. I mean, it's it's five two at that time. You've got a five-minute major, so you've got a chance to score as many goals as you can, and you get two goals in that scenario. And it's 5-4 with a chance to pull the goalie late and tie the hockey game. They didn't do it. They had a couple of grade-A chances, to your point. Uh, Fred Reek in the other end made a couple of big saves. And, you know, truthfully, when you know, when we embarked on this road trip, having already gone back and forth to New York and, you know, that awkward weekend where you come home and then you go right back on the road. And the scheduling, I don't think, set up for a great trip for Minnesota. But you kind of felt like if they could get four points on this trip, you know, knowing you've got Philadelphia and Buffalo waiting next week when you get back home, the Wild will be in a pretty good position. Well, they're one and one so far, and you've got the two Florida teams here on the back end of this trip. And I think it gets a little bit intensified on the Wild side of things because most of the dads are on the trip. You've got mentors, you've got brothers. Um, so you've got some extra motivation. And having watched this play out, um, you know, in, in seasons past, Seth, it's brought out the best in our hockey team. So I think uh, the Wild are hoping it does the same on this trip as well. Well, it's just, it feels like a perfect opportunity just to get a little bit of a breather with the extra time in Florida. You know, you play the Panthers Saturday and then don't play the Lightning till Tuesday. So a chance to just kind of reset. And the All-Star break is coming up as well, but it just, it, it feels like a team that just has gotten a little road weary with all the travel this month and, 
it's not like they're it's not like they're playing the the bottom feeders in the east and the west it's it's a lot of the top teams in both conferences that they uh, are squaring off against here it's the toughest stretch of road hockey they'll play all season it's it's a combination of the travel and who they're playing and no one's going to make excuses and no one's going to feel sorry for the Minnesota Wild because the flip side of this is they're home through most of February and they've got that all-star break to kind of recharge the battery. And the other thing is right now they're healthy. And so you've got some depth in this lineup. And so you got to make some hay while the sun is shining. And I, I think right now they're just trying to take it game by game, but uh, they like the position they're in. I mean, the wild to put themselves once again in a very good position to be a playoff team. And now it comes down to staying consistent, staying healthy, and not letting one loss turn into two or three losses. I thought last year that is what the Minnesota Wild did better than most other teams they were in competition with, is they didn't let one or two games turn into four, five, or six. They didn't have that stretch where they didn't get any points. In the Western Conference, you go a week without getting a point, you're going to see significant change in where you are in those standings, and that's what they're trying to avoid right now. And I think these two games are critical for them to at least get one win, to play good hockey, and, you know, if you're looking at this, you know, pragmatically, um, they do not play well for whatever reason in Sunrise against the Florida Panthers. This has been a house of horrors here in the last decade. They played great in Tampa, but after Tampa came to Minnesota a couple of weeks ago on a nationally televised game and got beat 5-1 and then heard about it after the game from everybody in the media about how many times the Wild had beaten them consecutively, you better bring your absolute A game in Tampa. So these are going to be two tough games. Kevin, let's talk about the big news going on with the Minnesota Wild uh, before we take a little bit of a deeper look at the Panthers. Obviously, Matt Dumba, a healthy scratch against the Hurricanes, and now it has come out that uh, he will be a healthy scratch against the Panthers as well. Dean Evason pointing out that they had a nice talk about it. They had a, a good conversation about the reasoning why. And you look at what Alex Goligoski brought to the uh, the decor against the Hurricanes, and um, one of the only guys that was uh, in positive territory and plus minus. He had a couple of shot blocks um, and had, a, I think, a takeaway as well. So was contributing and doing some nice things, and so now he starts for a second consecutive game um, against the Panthers. What is kind of the vibe like with all of this surrounding Matt Dumba that is uh, is kind of uh, a little bit of a cloud over the team at this point. Well, I'll be honest. And, and Galagoski, by the way, also hit a crossbar in that game. He, he was very impactful. So your, your analysis is spot on with how well he played. It's a little awkward right now. And, you know, I think bubbling under the surface is uh, the pressure that, that Matt Dumba's on right now because of where he is with his contract, likely not going to be back in Minnesota next year. Will he get moved at the deadline? Will he have the summer to explore other options? That's a difficult thing for a player. And then let's not forget, he's one of the captains for this hockey team. He's a leader. He's one of the, uh, I think, you know, real heartbeat guys behind the scenes. When they line up to go on the ice, you know, every team has a routine, Seth, but I'm down there every night and he's one of the ringleaders, getting them pumped up, getting them fired up, getting them in line, getting them motivated to go on the ice and, and go to battle. And so um, I, I think a very... Poignant move by Dean Everson. I don't think this came easy. I think this was something that was brewing over weeks, not days. And I think that it sends a message to the entire team that we're going to hold everybody accountable. And it would have been a lot easier to take Kalen Addison out of the lineup. And I know he's on the power play, and I get that. But that would have been the easier move for this coaching staff if you want to get Galagoski back in, because Alex Galagoski is a damn good defenseman. But I think Dean Everson believes – that, that Matt Dumba needs this time to kind of maybe reset a little bit. And they've always said, you know, the message to Matt Dumba from day one has been play within yourself. And if you watched that game in Washington, he was not playing with him himself. He was taking chances, making silly plays with the puck. That is exactly what the wild don't want to do. And so they're trying to, I think, help him become a better player. I know this has got to be hard on Matt. Um, I think the world of Matt Dumba, but um, no, you mentioned a cloud and, you know, being in and around the locker room with all the dads here right now and the festive atmosphere, um, it tempers some of that for sure. Uh, and it's, it's going to be a situation that is going to do nothing but kind of just, just hang there until something is done about it. And so, oh, it's not something that's going away anytime soon, but uh, 
hopefully it is just a little bit of an opportunity for him to kind of get himself right and uh, get back to uh, get back to that spot next to Jonas Brodeen. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, the Panthers and what they bring to the table because it's been a weird season for the Panthers to say the least. Uh, as we continue today's pregame edition of Locked on Wild, after a word from our sponsors. Today's pregame preview is brought to you by Built Bar. And if you're looking for a delicious treat to help you with your snack cravings, Built Bar is the one for you. And if you are looking for the perfect healthy treat, Built Bars are only 130 calories and just 4 grams of sugar while containing a whopping 17 grams of protein. All that while being covered in 100% real chocolate. Sounds too good to be true, right? But if you head to Built.com, you can get Built Bars for yourself, or you can head to your local Walmart or Sam's Club to grab a four-pack or 13-pack box to get your snack cravings going right. All that and more as part of Built Bar, and find them at Built.com. Continuing today's pregame preview edition of Lockdown Wild, looking at the Florida Panthers, who are next up for the Minnesota Wild. Seth Topol joined by Kevin Gorg. Kevin, a Florida team that was one of the best in the Eastern Conference last year. They made the big trade with the Calgary Flames in the offseason. And it just is fascinating to me that both teams have taken a step back this year. But it's a Florida team that is still very dangerous offensively. And so uh, it just because they're not the Florida Panthers of last year doesn't mean that they're not going to be a problem uh, for the Wild in this game. Yeah, it sure feels like at some point both Calgary and, and Florida are going to figure it out. I, I thought at the time, the moves that they made, I thought both teams might be better down the road, but it hasn't played out that way. Um, they have underachieved. They've struggled. There's a new coaching regime there with Paul Maurice behind the bench for Florida. And, you know, we're all pretty partial to Andrew Brunette in these parts. So, um, you know, we got to give a lot of respect out to the job that Brunette did with this hockey team. And I think they probably should have kept him. I mean, bottom line, not that Paul Maurice is not a coach. He's been around a long time, but I just think the, the the vibe and the mix, the way Florida likes to play, I think fit to the style that Andrew Burnett coached. And it's been an adjustment for the Panthers. It's only half a season and they're going to be better in the second half than they were in the first. The interesting dynamic right now with this hockey team is we try to handicap the game against the wild is they have two great goaltenders that right now aren't healthy. And so, like the Wild, that depth of that position is being tested. Spencer Knight didn't dress in Montreal last night. Uh, and then Sergei Bobrovsky, who started the game, left after a couple minutes, didn't even make a save in that game. The cool story that's developing, and we won't know until tomorrow to confirm this, but Alex Lyon is the guy that came off the bench last night, bought at Bay Native, guy that played at Hockey Day Minnesota back in 2008, been kind of a journeyman, floated around from Philadelphia won a Calder Cup with the Chicago Wolves in the American Hockey League. Um, he's front and center right now against his hometown team, and that'd be really a, a fun thing, not just for us on the broadcast, but for Wild fans as well. Uh, Kevin, you look at the offense for the Minnesota Wild, and it's not just something that kind of popped up against the Hurricanes. This team has struggled at points to create and sustain zone presence to be able to give them multiple shot opportunities. Michael Russo has used the phrase one and done a lot with uh, various lines where they get one shot on net and that's about it. What does this team need to do in order to be able to get a couple of lines that can hold the zone and can allow for multiple opportunities to where then you force a goalie to make two, three, four saves or you uh, end up coming away with a goal? They've got to hold the puck. They've got to be stronger down low. I mean, I think that's the strength of their top line. And I think the challenge they've seen play out in front of their eyes all season long is can they get consistent secondary scoring? The Kaprizov line's been pretty consistent. Both Zuccarello and Kaprizov are having uh, tremendous years with their offensive output. But from that uh, line all the way through, it hasn't been consistent. And I think having the zone, when this team's at their best, Seth, and I look at parts of that, Washington game, specifically the, the second period, when the Minnesota Wild are in the offensive zone, cycling the puck, and then using that strength down low because they're a heavy, big, strong team, to get their defensemen involved out high, good things happen. We saw it last year. The reason they were successful so often late in games is they had four lines that could go. 
They could grind you out down low, and then they had defensemen that could jump in and make a play. Well, when you think of the six-on-five goals they scored last year, so many of those plays were dictated by plays at the blue line out high by their defensemen because they had established net front presence. They had gotten down low and cycled the puck and spent time in the offensive zone wearing down that defense. That hasn't been consistently there for the Minnesota Wild, and it's it's hurt them. It hurt them last night in Carolina, and it will hurt them moving forward. And I think, you know, a couple of key things. You hope that Matt Boldy scoring that goal late in that hockey game, now a meaningless goal because they lost 5-2, gets him going a little bit. He had gone 11 games without a goal. That's not going to work for the Minnesota Wild. And then you, you've got to get that grief line producing. I know that they're great defensively. But if you look back at what they did last year, I thought it was sustainable. It hasn't matched this year, but they really haven't been together and healthy. And now you're starting to see just some signs that they're coming. Jordan Greenway has been absolutely snake bit. If, if a puck starts to go in here and there for Jordan Greenway, you know X going to get his, and sooner or later Felino is going to make a play. But that line has got to start producing too for the Minnesota Wild. Uh, let's let's talk to close about Philip Gustafson getting the start against the Panthers and Gustafson. It seems like has been at his best uh, against the better teams in the NHL. So he's got kind of that giant killer status to him. And I think the stat was uh, in games in which he's been forced to make thirty plus saves. He's five one and one, and the peripheral numbers are even better. Uh, how much does he enjoy being that guy that can go up against these top teams and just say, "Hey, you're not getting one past me." He's really relished that situation, and I had a, a long conversation with him after practice today about the zone that he's in, and he readily admitted it, Seth. He said, you know, I'm, I'm feeling good about my game, I'm, you know, and I've just got my confidence right now. And for a young goaltender that was unproven, that we knew nothing about in the training camp, didn't have the best preseason. Bill Guerin talked about it. He wasn't in the best shape, but between Freddie Shabbat, our goaltending coach, and the influence of the would-be Hall of Famer, Mark andre Fleury, he's found something. He's working hard. He's in better shape. And when I've asked him about playing with Mark andre Fleury, he said what blew him away is Mark andre Fleury is almost 40 years old, and he never takes a drill off. He said when he saw that play out before his eyes early on in training camp into that first week of the season, he's like, okay, I've got to be better. I've got to do more. Well, it's working. And now he's starting to really get into a groove. And, you know, who knows how good this kid can be. He's still – has yet to play a full 80-game season in the National Hockey League. But right now the signs are um, get him out there as much as you can because you know, when a guy's riding the heater like he is right now, you gotta you got to make the hay while that sun's shining. And so uh, another big test tomorrow for him. Uh, he's been great on the road. He's been really good against good teams, as you mentioned. And I'm sure uh, when you play in Florida, you're going to see a lot of shots. I would guess tomorrow 35 to 40 shots are coming his way. And, uh, you know, if you're a fan of the Minnesota Wild, you've got to be a fan of the Gus Bus. He has been one of, if not the biggest surprise of this season here at the halfway point. Most definitely. Well, we'll see how things play out, and uh, we will have a chance to chat with you after the game for uh, a Locked on Wild postcast. So, listeners, we've got you covered pre- and post-game for this one, and uh, looking forward to what should be an exciting game between these two teams. Uh, Kevin, thank you for the time. And uh, we'll catch up with you after the game for Locked on Wild listeners. Make sure you don't miss out on the Locked on Wild postcast recapping the action against the Panthers. For everything else we have to offer at Locked on Wild, make sure you are subscribed everywhere you can on your favorite podcast platforms and on YouTube as well. We've got new episodes all week long as part of the Locked on Sports podcast network.